What is up guys? Welcome back to the channel. And welcome back to another part in Gotham Knights. Hope you guys enjoyed the last episode. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Because we found out something crazy in the last episode. I don't even want to spoil it. So you better go just go watch that shit. I don't know why you're here if you're not watching it. But today, we have something we need to do. We have, in the collections, Bruce's audio logs. I want to listen to these today. So... That's basically what I'm just going to do today. Just I don't even know how long they are. But, like, it's just going to be the auto log today, as today's episode. I'm not going to talk, like, really much or at all. I'm just going to let us all listen to the audio logs. And that's going to be a wrap on this. So, hope you guys enjoy this. And let's get straight into this. Bruce's audio logs. I'm assuming these are in order. Let's do it. <clears throat> this is log entry BT01. Alfred has encouraged me to make time for this. A personal record feels meaningless when there's so much work to be done. But he doesn't ask me for much. So, it's been a year since I came back to Gotham. There was always darkness in this city. It used to be insidious. Now it's out in the open. The police ignore violence and embrace corruption. Someone had to do something. Batman felt necessary. A year later, it's clear he is necessary. He's the one who speaks the only language Gotham's enemies understand. Violence and fear. It's working. I'm starting to rein in the chaos. But I need to be more careful. Batman is always on the edge of a knife. If I let him go too far, he becomes one of them. That can't happen. Batman can't kill criminals. He needs to demonstrate a higher standard. As Alfred put it, surrendering to violent impulses is easy. Controlling them is what takes courage. Gotham doesn't need a Batman with blood on his hands. I'm doing my best. But there's always room for Batman to improve. Not all of these criminals need to be hurt. Some of them just need help. <clears throat> Alfred was right. This did make me feel a little better. Or at least, I think I understand all of this more. Maybe this record will be useful someday. If I ever have doubts about Batman, Gotham, or any of it. But that's definitely for later. For now, Batman has so much left to do. Log entry BT-17. So much has changed since I recorded the first one of these. I spent the entire time thinking Batman could do this alone, in complete secrecy. But that's just not possible. Besides Alfred, there are two people on the planet who know Batman's true identity. And only because I told them. It's a risk I don't regret. Jim Gordon earned the right to know. He's the only cop in Gotham I truly trust. And I've learned so much from him, especially about how we achieve justice. I envisioned Batman as vengeance, but Jim helped me make something more out of it. I never wanted to be a detective, but I'm good at it. And he makes me better. What I like most about Jim is that he doesn't want the recognition. He only wants to do what's right. Lucius Fox has me thinking a lot about what right means. When I asked him to help Batman, Lucius wanted nothing to do with it. Justice defined by a white man with wealth and power is hardly justice, he said. It's a crusade. That's why I love Lucius. He doesn't care what Bruce Wayne thinks of him. At all. But he cares deeply about what Batman stands for. Lucius is... my moral compass. Once I realized that, he finally agreed to get involved. I'm grateful he started by saying no. He was right. Batman shouldn't be a caped crusader. Gotham deserves a better kind of knight. Log entry BT-28. It's New Year's Eve at... Huh. I suppose it's New Year's Day. Anyway, Alfred asked about my New Year's resolution. 
What does Bruce Wayne want to achieve this year? I didn't have an answer for him, so he locked me down here with my teeth until I figured it out. Batman's purpose is clear. Mine... isn't. Besides Batman, there's not a lot I care about. I didn't love saying that out loud. It makes me sound like one of them. The tricksters and clowns and gangsters across Gotham who... <sighs> I can't even talk to myself without talking about Batman. But protecting people... It's all I'm good at. Maybe that's it. I'm spending this fortune on Batmobiles, building this enormous cave. Meanwhile, Gotham has problems Batman can't solve. But... Bruce Wayne might be able to. Jim Gordon's worried about being able to put his daughter through college. Lucius mentioned how great it would be to have a foundation that helps disadvantaged youth study tech. I can take the hint. Then there's always providing relief for the homeless. The Dark Knight works alone, but Bruce Wayne doesn't have to. So, I suppose my resolution is to invest in other people. Alfred will like that. Maybe enough to let me back upstairs and let me sleep in my bed. Because that medical gurney is really uncomfortable. Log entry BT-79. In a move that surprises even me, I've hired Harley Quinn as a research partner. Or rather, I've hired Dr. Harleen Quinzel, a trained psychiatrist whose work in criminal profiling surpasses even mine. Of course, some of that work is based on her personal experience as a criminal. While this aspect of her history is impossible to overlook, in this instance, it's invaluable. It took less convincing than I thought to gain her cooperation. A chance to do good, a small honorarium, and a ride in the Batwing were all the perks she requested. My contacts tell me Harley is comfortably installed at Blackgate. It's genius on her part. No one will suspect her presence, even if she's not actually serving a sentence right now. It puts her in the perfect location to carry out the research I need. It does also put her back into the criminal lifestyle we'd all prefer she left behind. But I will check in on her progress occasionally. I've given her the pattern I'm looking for. She's positioned to comb the records and profile the subjects. They, if they really do exist, won't be looking for Harley. And I'll keep it that way. Not a whispered word is said. Log entry BT-33. Crossed paths with Batgirl on patrol tonight. It's been a few weeks since she joined the team. Not that she'd put it that way. She's accepted some training, resources, nothing more. Even had some choice words to share about the Bat computer's tech. <laughs> I get it. She was doing fine without me. Far better than I would have without the means I was born into. No wonder she insists on sticking to her own cases. Reminds me of someone else I know. Everything Jim has ever said about his daughter is true. I won't be the one to tell him. That's her right. He saw the corruption in the Force and tried to shield her from it. So she found another way to keep Gotham safe. But she is not like Batman. Batman and Robin fight crime by cover of night. But Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson are somehow still... sheltered in a way she isn't. She sees things that we don't. Maybe we've lived in a mansion too long. Barbara's different. She's driven by something I... can't quite understand. Most people freeze up when faced with others' pain. But she sees the hurt at Gotham's core. And she has to get involved. To her, it was never a choice. <laughs> Dick asked me to bring her further into the fold, to truly work together. But I'm not the one that needs convincing. 
Barbara insists she doesn't need me. And frankly, she's right. But Gotham does need Batgirl. We're fortunate to have her on our team. In whatever way she sees fit. Log entry BT-66. Earlier this week, I confronted Basil Carlo, otherwise known as Clayface. It didn't go as I had hoped. I keep asking myself, could I have been faster? Maybe. Led him away to safer ground. <sighs> I'd been over the footage. No. He had several hostages at the reservoir. There was no time for backup or for elaborate plans. We fought, and he lost his footing. I couldn't stop him. When he hit the turbine, it confirmed what I had feared. One of us was going to die that night. But... Basil always had a sense for the dramatic. An epic confrontation in front of an audience would have fit his plans. As he put it, it was most important to be seen. Looking back at the footage of the fall, I remembered one of Basil's earliest roles. A bit part in an adaptation of a Sherlock Holmes story. I compared the footage to his early film, and the staging was... nearly identical. Now I wonder if he didn't cast himself as Moriarty to my homes, with that reservoir as Reichenbach Falls. Or, more in keeping with his ego, he cast himself as the hero. I'm going to continue studying Basil's DNA. If what I suspect is true, it's possible that some part of Clayface is still out there, alive. But what could be left of him? Log entry, BT-42. Alfred, I can't do this. Not now. If you don't make time for this now, Master Bruce, then when will you? Take all the time you need. I didn't know so much could go so wrong. There's nowhere else I can go. Dick stopped by Gotham again. Our meetings lately have been... strained. I pushed him away. And this time, I don't know if he'll ever come back. He worried about my obsessions. But I wasn't focused nearly enough. If I was, then Barbara... She got hurt. Paralyzed. Maybe permanently. Because she was trying to help me. I let her take on too much. I should have been there. I failed her. Barbara, and Dick, and... Jason. Jason barely got a chance. He could have been great for Gotham. The best kind of Robin. But he was reckless, rushing into danger like that. <sighs> no. I'm responsible for this. After being too strict with Dick, I tried to give Jason more freedom. I should have been paying more attention. He went off on his own to be a hero. Then that monster murdered him for it. He was killed because of me. I'd do anything to fix this. Things I said I'd never do. Like speak with Talia again. I swore to myself I'd never consider using a Lazarus pit. The risks, even compared to death, were too great. But I had to know if resurrection was even possible. But when I tracked her down, I couldn't even ask for her help. One more thing I got wrong. And Talia just laughed. I broke almost every rule I have to bring Jason back. And I have nothing to show for it. He's really gone. Sixty. <laughs> Batman failed. I failed everyone. I don't know how to make any of this right. 
but I'm going to find a way. Log entry BT-70. I don't often have dreams. But this morning, I woke up from one about Nightwing. Dick came back to Gotham. We sat right here in this room. Together. He let me explain myself. Apologized for pushing him away. I found all the words I should have said before he left. That's how I knew none of it was real. He asked me about something we used to talk about. Batman's legacy. You know, who wears the cowl when Bruce Wayne can't. For years, I thought I had the answer. Every time I looked at Dick Grayson, I saw the next Batman. But Dick never wanted it. I've been monitoring his activities in Bloodhaven. It's amazing what he's accomplished on his own. His way. With courage and kindness. I see it clearly now. I don't want Nightwing to become Batman. I need Batman to be more like Nightwing. Despite everything. I just wish he was home. So we could talk. Really talk. I'd tell him how proud I really am. That Nightwing is the better version of what Batman was meant to be. That because of Dick Grayson, Bruce Wayne became a better man. I'd tell my son that I miss him. I'll tell him the next time he comes back. He doesn't need me bothering him. He doesn't need me at all. Log entry BT-55. I stopped by Victor Freeze's new cell at Blackgate earlier tonight. <sighs> Victor is looking at two years for his latest escapade. But his cell is adapted to his condition. So in theory, he can stay there for any sentence, regardless of length. I made a promise to Victor long ago that I'd try to help his wife, Nora. Recently, advancements in medical technology made that possible. As much as I was glad to help Nora herself, I had also hoped that helping her would encourage Victor to change his ways. But after her successful decryonization and treatment at Gotham General, Nora wanted no part of their previous relationship. She recognized what I'd been reluctant to accept. Mr. Freeze has embraced his identity as a villain and is loath to give it up. At her request, I safely relocated Nora. Her instincts were right. His response was violence. I subdued him and brought him to the GCPD. Victor now insists that Nora rejected him due to his condition rather than his actions. He asked for my help in finding a cure. I agreed. I've looked at my work for Nora. I think I can do it. That will let him live more comfortably. But I told him it won't bring Nora back. Until Victor accepts that his problems are because of his violent behavior, he'll keep returning to the same criminal patterns. I only hope I can make him understand that. Log entry BT-57. It's been two months since I confronted Red Hood. Wanted criminal, confirmed killer. Jason. At first, I didn't want to believe it. But after that shock came hope. He's still driven by a sense of justice. There's still a part of him I can recognize as Robin. He's talking to me, but he's so angry. Not so much at his murderer, but at me. I deserve his anger. He was just a child when I put him in harm's way. I pushed him too hard, too fast. He's made it clear that he'll never let go of his desire for vengeance. But he's come to understand that violence has its limits. I can only be grateful Jason's meeting me halfway. He's accepted counseling. We're finding a way to move forward. He's even suggested we work on a new kind of pistol for him, together. Something that's more 
that friendly. I have some reservations about that. But he insists it's possible, and his prototypes are promising. He's making an incredible effort to come back from that cliff. To be a better man. So far, I've been unable to find out what happened between Jason's murder and his appearance on Gotham streets as the Red Hood. His amnesia seems total, but not necessarily irreversible. Maybe with time, he'll remember. Alfred and I ran every test we could think of. The last one confirmed my suspicions. We found evidence he'd been exposed to a Lazarus pit. Was Jason revived by Raish? Talia? Another faction or cult? Raish has healed his injuries, no matter how severe in Lazarus pits. Ongoing exposure has rendered him practically immortal, though at the cost of his humanity. Raish's original goal when he founded the League was to destroy a corrupted society, to then rebuild it to a pure form. Now, he seems to have lost sight of any reconstruction. He views all human beings as irredeemably flawed, even Talia. For all his anger, Jason is nothing like that. My working theory is that a single short exposure to a Lazarus pit won't cause a permanent shift in personality. But I need to learn more. For Jason's sake. I won't lose him again. Log entry BT-49. Six months since Tim Drake showed up. This kid not only figured out Batman's identity, but connected every dot. Nightwing, Alfred, Jason Todd, and at just 13. Tim is certainly smarter than I was at that age. In a raw sense, maybe even now. A natural detective. When Tim figured out who we all were, my first thought was, how did he do it? And then, how could he use this against us? Even more paranoid than usual. I've been in a dark place since Jason died. Robin's mask now feels like a curse I inflicted on Jason. And Dick. Tim wants the mask anyway. He says Batman needs Robin. Alfred and Dick just encourage this. They insist Tim just wants to help. There was a time I thought that I was helping Dick. Certainly thought I was helping Jason. If it were only that simple. Tim thinks everything has an answer. He has this absolute enthusiasm I can't possibly match. I worry I'll just grind that enthusiasm to dust, like I did with the others, whether I want to or not. It's just what I am. Though Tim would be better off without the mask, if he has to wear it, pushing him away would be dangerous. For some reason I can't understand, he trusts me. I'm certain I don't know what's best for the kid, but with all his potential and that raw genius, maybe, just maybe, we can make this work. Log entry BT-81. I just finished packing Alfred's luggage into the taxi. I can't believe after months of nagging, he finally agreed to take a vacation. He always has an excuse. If it's not a case stopping him, he's too busy redecorating the manor or helping Tim on a project. But I could see it in his eyes when the fog rolled in. Or the way he sighed as he made a cup of tea. He missed England. He says I'm so focused on stopping the next criminal that I don't appreciate what I've already accomplished. But he's guilty of that too. He's the one who works from the shadows, making sure I survive every night. Every patrol. If anyone deserves a vacation, it's Alfred. I looked it up. The last time he took time off was after we captured Firefly. At least four years ago. I don't think he would have left if Tim hadn't promised to look after me while he's gone. Even Jason stepped in and said he would cook for me so I don't. And I quote, 
die from salmonella. To show his gratitude, Alfred assured us he will give Ace the fanciest treats money can buy. <laughs> I swear that dog has us wrapped around his paw. Anyway, Alfred shouldn't worry so much. I'm clearly in good hands. And I'll sleep better at night knowing he'll be out of reach of the people I'm currently investigating. <laughs>